All right, we'll jump back into the AUKUS announcement a little later. We'll cross to San Diego, but plenty of news around in Australia. Let's get into it now. Sky News Northern Australia correspondent Matt Cunningham. Matt, welcome. I mentioned this just before in my editorial. Labor's hit the ground reviewing. They were very critical of the Morrison government. It had 75 reviews in its first 12 months. These guys, 140 reviews, 38 consult uh, consultation papers, accords and strategies, two summits, one royal commission, 51 ministerial roundtables. Now, these are not reviews where they're scratching their head looking for answers. These are reviews that give them cover about things they're going to do anyway. You know, shared parenting changes, that's a good example in the family court. And I just wish political parties of both persuasions were up front with voters. You know, when I started in politics in 98, you used to put forward a whole lot of policies at an election. There'd be a health policy, there'd be one for, you know, social welfare. We don't get any of that now, and we only find out about it after they're in office. Well, the sort of review depends on who exactly and what they're reviewing, doesn't it, though, Peter? I mean, if they're reviewing something that the former government from the other side has done, then it is, you know, a forensic uh, review that wants to, to dig up the dirt and find out, you know, exactly what went wrong. But if they're doing a review for their own purposes, it's a very different kind of review, and it's a review uh, that gives them the answers they want to, to be able to, as you say, give them cover um, to implement the sort of policy that they want. The other thing that I find with governments is the longer that they go on, the less inclined they are to want to do any kind of genuine review. You, you look at the government in Victoria at the moment that's been in power since 2014. Now, you would think that there is the need for some kind of independent inquiry or review into what's happening with the IBAC down there, given the extraordinary comments that the former IBAC commission has made in Victoria, but I don't think there's any chance uh, that you'll see the Victorian government doing that anytime soon. In fact, you know, I think the Premier's now described him as, uh, you know, a bloke who used to run an agency. Uh, he was formerly one of the most respected jurists in the country. So, you know, and I think that new governments have this um, tendency to come in and say, oh, yeah, we're going to look into this and we're going to review that and we're going to have an inquiry into this and we're going to be open and we're going to be transparent and we're going to be uh, upfront with the people. Uh, and then the longer that they're in power, the, the less willing they are um, to actually conduct a genuine review into something uh, or a genuine inquiry, unless it's a stacked one and they know exactly what answer it's going to give mm. them. I always look for who's on the review panel. Uh, if it's a, a mate of whatever the political persuasion is, you know that it's a preordained outcome. They know exactly what they're going to get in the report. If it's fair income, then it has a fair income panel. Let's go to energy. Tomorrow, the uh, Australian Energy Regulator will release what's called the draft default market offer. That's the reference price for power in New South Wales, South Australia and South East Queensland. Queensland Treasury says it could be as much as $370 extra the Queenslanders will cop this year. One pub mad in Melbourne says they're going to charge pints at $16. Now, no surprise, energy is a big uh, input cost if you run a pub, but uh, who, who, who is uh, going to be able to afford these prices? I mean, up your way, turning the AC on, it's, it's not an optional extra. How do people make ends meet? Certainly not an optional extra at this time of year, uh, Peter, that's for sure. That, I mean... I've also got to query what's going on there in Victoria. I grew up in country Victoria and no one would have been seen dead drinking a pint uh, when I was, uh, when I was uh, working at the Garfield pub 25 years ago. We drank seven ounce glasses and I think at the time they cost $1.30. So uh, 16 bucks for a, a pint of beer is a fairly extraordinary uh, cost. Uh, it's remarkable what we've done to ourselves in this country when it comes to energy policy and, and that promise um, that the government made before the election to bring down energy prices uh, by $275 a year is not ageing particularly well, you'd have to say. But, you know, it, it is just extraordinary what we're doing. And you look at the, the comments last week from the former Productivity Commissioner, you know, Gary Banks, where basically mm. he said, we've basically been hell-bent on eliminating our competitive advantage when it comes to energy um, policy, and you're seeing that continue. I mean, the cap on uh, gas that uh, the government's implemented uh, is not having the effect of bringing down power prices. In fact, it looks, um, you know, from these numbers, like it might be doing the opposite, and yet we have all these supply issues, um, and yet we can't seem to get the gas out of the ground that we need to bring down these prices. Yeah, we have plenty of gas. We just have uh, supply issues. Um, I mentioned at the top of the show, I've never said anything like this. This is a Palmer Party United Australian Senator for Victoria, Ralph Babbitt. 
He's been open on Twitter about his second job. His second job's in his family's real estate business. He says, I enjoy working, sitting around on the weekend doing nothing, feels like a waste of time, so I'd rather work. Now, he is paid to represent Victorians. Most politicians I know, left and right, work on weekends. There's always something to attend. There's an event to go to, the sporting club or whatever. Just get out there and talk to some constituents. But this is his family's real estate business, and he also mentions he's quite happy or quite open to going back into real estate when he leaves the parliament. Uh, I think he presumes he's not going to get re-elected. But I, I, I don't think we should cop this. Well, we absolutely shouldn't cop this. Uh, it's not unprecedented. I can tell you there was a case up here in the Northern Territory about 20 years ago when there was a guy elected to the Parliament who kept working uh, as a lawyer, and that lasted about five minutes once that was revealed and uh, he was forced to resign. But, you know, when people elect you to represent them in, in the Australian Parliament or the Victorian Parliament, um, they expect that you will work for them full-time. It is a full-time job. It's a big commitment. And let's be honest, it, it pays a lot more money, um, you know, than the average wage that most people earn. So, you know, it's extraordinary that someone can then go and take that wage and then say, well, I'm going to keep doing this work, you know, for myself on the side. That's not what people expect when they elect someone to Parliament. They expect you to be working for them full-time, not just Monday to Friday, Saturday, Saturday and Sunday as well, that's what you sign up for uh, when you put your hand up to be in politics and that's what people expect. I don't think this is a situation that should be allowed to continue. Yeah, I hope it's pursued when the Parliament uh, returns. Matt Cunningham, thank you.